Hello and welcome everyone to our very first webinar series, um, New Tools of the Trade in Life Sciences, Technologies that Enable Breakthroughs. And today's title of, uh, talk title is Advancing Single Molecule Microscopy with Active Stabilization. My name is Cindy Cook. I am um, the project lead for the BioProtocol webinar series. And for those of you who are not familiar with BioProtocol, BioProtocol is an open access online journal with the mission to make research more transparent and reproducible. And I'm very excited to see so many of you here who share this vision with us. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator of today's session, Dr. Antoine de Moret. Antoine is an assistant professor at the Department of Biomedicine at Aarhus University in Denmark. His lab investigates the mechanisms that enable adult stem cells to regenerate tissues. His work has been published in high profile journals as just such as Science and Nature. And he also regularly teaches communication and resilience to science trainees. And he co wrote the book Magnetic How Great Leaders Persuade and Inspire. Antoine holds a PhD from Leiden University in the Netherlands and a postdoc certificate from the Stanford University and an IGNITE certificate from the Stanford University Graduate School of Business. He is also a cert Stanford certified facilitator of compassion. Antoine, Anton, thank you so much for being here and I'm handing it over to you. Thank you, Cindy, for that wonderful introduction. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> thank you all for, for tuning in to this uh, exciting, pivotal moment in thinking bioprotocols history. The, the goal of this webinar series is to continue with bioprotocols mission of uh, facilitating our uh, reproducibility of research, but also giving you an easier time at accessing great, uh, technologies that can uh, feature breakthroughs in your research. Now, the idea of this is that it's going to be an interactive webinar. So for that, you have some tools in the explain that you can uh, funnel questions directly into the chat and we will be monitoring the chat as we go. But you also have a raise hand button if something comes true or if at the end you want to uh, you want to talk to us. So for that, if we can just try out that that raise hand button work, I have a simple question for you. Uh, where are you right now? So could you press the raise hand button? if you are uh, tuning in from Europe. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. We have about 10% of uh, 105 attendees tuning in from Europe. Gonna lower all those hands. How about raising your hand if you're tuning in from the USA? All right, 10% of people coming out from the USA, thank you. How about the Greater Americas? All right, welcome again. We have a good number coming in from the wider Americas. I'll lower your hands now. How about Asia? Any attendees coming in from Asia? Definitely well represented. Thank you all for coming here. So it, as you can see, um, reproducibility and access to breakthrough technology protocols, that is an issue that spans worldwide continents across the globe. We are tuning in uh, with researchers uh, from, from, from all around. If I wanna be complete, anyone tuning in from Africa? And we even reach the African continent. It was very exciting. Thank you for, uh, for tuning in. Um, uh, like I said, this is a, this is a, a big moment. It is our first um, webinar here. We're going to delve into imaging technologies. And of course, in, in, our, in our goal towards understanding biology, understanding the location, the number of molecular complexes in the context of a cell, which is a complex context, um, is very important understanding functional capabilities and how those molecules can be modulated in the context of health and disease. Now, single molecule detection methods have greatly advanced our ability to visualize and study molecules, but these, this technique is still very much under development and faces numerous challenges such as under labeling and sampling drift. And it is in, in light of this progression at how we uh, move this technology forward to facilitate uh, answering these research questions that we're very excited to introduce our speaker today, Simao Pereo Coelho who has made seminal contributions towards improving our ability to visualize single molecules in complex systems. And we're very excited that he's present today as starting speaker 
of the BioProtocol webinar series to share his expertise. So to give you a bit of background on uh, Dr. Coelho, he obtained his PhD uh, in biophysics uh, from King's, Con uh, King's College in London back in 2015, where he started with developing microscopy technologies for spatial temporal imaging of biosensors, and that case is FRET imaging. Um, after having done that, uh, his uh, okay. interest in developing new technologies proceeded. He moved to Australia to perform postdoctoral training in the lab of uh, Dr. Katharina Gauss, where he developed methods that improved single molecule localization microscopy. And he actually reached nanometer resolution, which enabled him to accurately measure distances between cell surface receptors and downstream signaling mediators. So really getting an up close look. So Dr. Kaleo built his own microscopes and he published in BioProtocol how you can establish a re, uh, assemble a replica of his system. And today he will talk more about this work, but also his more recent work towards uh, correcting uh, sample drift during image acquisition and maybe some of his work towards uh, fab, uh, nanofabrication and 3D printing. We're very excited. So with this, I hand the floor to you, um, Simao. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm just gonna share my screen quickly. Uh, that should, can you all see it? Yeah, okay. So I'm just gonna put the point option. We can to, see it, yeah. You can, okay, perfect. All right, so let's just. And your pointer is visible too. Okay, perfect. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you Antoine for very nice introduction. You went all the way back into threat imaging, which I've sort of somehow forgotten half of. Um, but what I'm here to talk to you about is primarily about single molecule imaging. So this is individual fluorophores that are tagged to a molecule, whatever molecule you want to image. And we probe each one of these molecules one by one. So essentially, we, we look at single molecules as they either move around or they present in the cell through fixed chemical fixation, etc. And the work I'm here to talk to you about is primarily... Uh, the adapt the active stabilization of the single molecule experiments. So what we do is we mix in fiducials, in our case, polystyrene beads. I'll show you some comparisons to uh, what's traditionally done. Uh, essentially, what we do is we put polystyrene beads and we track those beads in real time. And we do that faster than the acquisition speed of your typical fluorescent camera. Uh, so now my slide's not working. All right, there you go. Okay. So I split the talk up into three sort of bite sized sections. Uh, so, in the first part, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction of what we mean when we talk about single molecule localization microscopy, uh, some of the issues associated with that, such as long term stability of your device, of your system, et cetera. And the second part is how we correct for that uh, drift, how we correct for that mechanical motion, et cetera. And the Primary mechanism is, as I said before, is using polystyrene beads. So these, these beads that we illuminate with a, with a simple LED create these very bright diffraction rings, and we track those rings in three dimensions, and we essentially reposition the stage in real time. The purpose of that, of course, is to improve stability. So as we image for a very long time, we can now have everything sort of already aligned or pre-aligned to a precision that is better than the uh, photon limited uh, precision of your 404. And the third part is essentially an extension of the second. So I sort of lumped it all in here together. And instead of using polystyrene beads, what we use is direct laser writing, specifically two photon direct laser writing. And that's essentially a 3D printing mechanism, but instead of using plastic, you use light. So essentially you focus very well-defined focal volume onto your onto your photo curable resist. And essentially that, what that does, it solidifies the particle instead of having plastic where you heat it up and print it. What you do is you use a laser and solidify it. And now instead of having polystyrene be just randomly distributed, we can now print fiducials at different locations, different heights. You can make different geometries and essentially is to increase the versatility of, of what we could do previously. So in, instead of having polystyrene beads, we now have printed beads and we can manipulate those as much as we want. So very simply, when we talk about single molecule microscopy, there's there's a whole range of techniques. There's you know your typical what I'm going to talk to you about your palm storm DNA paint etc. There's of course the 
other very famous ones such as structure illumination or stead microscopy which i've worked with before but i'm not going to touch on this today because it's not particularly uh relevant for the bioprotocol paper that we're talking about so essentially single molecule imaging what happens is when you have a lot of fluorophores together so whether it's in a cell or dna origami etc what happens is they essentially they blur each other out so when you have um uh, in this case these half a dozen yellow molecules when they're all on at the same time what happens is the fluorescence essentially merges into each other the idea behind single molecule microscopy is we probe each one of these individually so one way of doing it is to stochastically turn them on and off so if we look here we can see one yellow molecule on and that creates a very well defined gaussian profile and we do the second the third etc just randomly turn these guys on and off uh this is in the case of storm which is stochastic activation uh of what i'm showing here uh this is done primarily through antibodies so you have an antibody with let's say a specific dial let's say alexa 647 etc you tag that antibody to the molecule that you want to image so it's specific of course uh to what you want to look at and then we essentially just randomly turn these guys on and off um another way to do it is an, a technique called dna paint but the antibody instead of having a fluorophore attached to it it has a single strand of dna and that single strand of dna is typically nine ten base pairs and what happens is you have a, a multitude of uh, complementary strands floating in the media and what happens is on that, the end of that complementary strand we have a fluorophore uh, ato alexa not really important what happens is the the molecule comes into contact so the single strand enters into contact with a complementary strand and they become bound temporarily so something of the order of 200 milliseconds and that creates a blink that creates that blinking effect so it's just it's a, a lock in and lock out so after 200 milliseconds it then docks out and gets released so in practice what happens is we have very uh individual blinking mechanisms we have one dot another dot another dot and we fit all those dots and the super resolved image in the end is sort of the reconstruction or the fitting of all these different points at different uh different locations which are separated in sort of time and space to give you an idea of what what that looks like essentially what i'm showing here is in practice the awful tower in a simulated single molecule version so you can hear the original image is showing all these blinks sort of like the Paris lights turning on and off and we use a particle detection algorithm that captures each one of these points individually it gives us the center of that molecule uh, or that blink in this case and then a reconstruction in the end so the reconstruction is the result of these blinking effects and the re what happens is you get a much better defined uh output in your reconstruction than you would through an original image because now you're looking at a better accuracy for each particular point so one of the issues however with this is the long-term drift associated with doing this sort of acquisition so what happens a lot is for very high resolution experiments such as dna paints we get of the order of you know a nanometer resolution or localization precision what happens is you need to image these guys for five six hours per color or in the case of dna paint per channel and if you have to image two three or four different channels that easily escalates to something of the order of 12 18 24 hours so what happens is this creates a problem because if you have your fluorophores moving in and out of focus or moving randomly completely outside of the field of view because your microscope is moving uh, you get a degradation in your final image uh, one way to correct for this is what's traditionally done so this is done in software where we use shown here on the left is essentially spheres uh, fluorescent beads that have moved over time so the the localization of the reconstruction looks smeared and blurred like this and in software what we do is we take chunks we sort of realign the molecules one by one and sort of recompile the image there's another way to do that which is using fluorescent uh, beads or something like gold nanorods or even fluorescent microspheres and each of these since they these points are always on essentially we just track these guys and reposition them always back into the center 
Um, of course, when we start looking at time acquisitions of the order of 24 hours or something like that, they, they can very well move completely outside of the field of view, or they can just lose focus entirely. So what we did is instead of using software version, we decided to go for a hardware version. And essentially what happens is we use these polystyrene beads, which I'm going to show to you in a minute, to track the position of the stage. So the polystyrene beads are very well attached. And the idea is that instead of having this drift effect where we have motion in between frames or even during the frame, with our drift correcting mechanism, so this repositioning in real time, we end up with a scenario which is essentially free of drift. So where, wherever the molecule blinks in the final overlaid reconstructed version, we can see in practice each point in its proper location. So the way we do it, we do it is, as I said before, relatively straightforward. We have in practice an, an LED, so in our case is an infrared LED, as to not interfere with the fluorescent samples. Typically, fluorescent emission will be on the order of green, red, etc. So we use an A50 nanometer LED, so it's out of the way. We illuminate a polystyrene bead. So this is this blue guy over here. This this blue polystyrene bead is essentially attached to the glass cover slip through biotin strept avenues. It's a really very strong connection which holds the bead against the glass. And the LED is then the diffraction pattern from this fiducial is imaged onto a separate camera. So we have this sort of interference pattern which tracks the vibration of this particle. And we use this, vib this vibration to apply an equal and opposite on the stage. So we essentially calculate how much the fiducial has moved and we reposition it at equal and opposite, sort of in three dimensions. Looking at you know, the what these beads look like, this, I'm showing here just a simulation of what the XY profile looks like. So you can see these very bright and dark rings. And what happens is when these beads shuffle left and right, you just see the rings moving up or down, left and right, etc. If they move uh, in or out of the focus, what happens is the actual profile of these rings change. So the rings become wider and fatter, so sort of further apart if it goes up or, the, or it becomes thinner if it goes down. So essentially what we do is we track how these rings become wider and how they shuffle around and we compare it to a predetermined actual lookup table. So it's a Z profile taken. So it's essentially before we start an experiment, we take a Z stack and we see the actual profile of these guys. Uh, looking at sort of a real sample, we can see here uh, two two polystyrene beads on our camera. So you've got these two red arrows pointing at, the, at these markers. And as I said before, we have a dedicated camera. So we have a separate camera to image just the diffraction rings via the LED. And you can see this red square is our infrared camera and it's significantly larger than our fluorescent camera. So this is our EMCCD, which is shown here in the white, in the white square at the bottom. So something like four or five times larger. So we can position these beads anywhere within this field of view and we can track them and essentially if they if we can track them we can reposition them in three dimensions so this white arrow that i'm pointing here is a is a t-cell so it's a cd8 positive t-cell it's it's activated against a, a lipid bilayer so we just stick a couple of molecules onto it and it, the t-cell tries to kill the glass essentially and we're trying to look at the molecular distribution of the immunological synapse but first a very brief look at what the sort of system looks like. If you want further details on how to build these guys, you can go to the proto bio protocol website. We, we published a whole uh, CAD design showing where all the lasers go, where all the different components go. But this is just your simple, uh, simple schematic, just showing where does the different components, where do they fit into. So if you have our excitation lasers, they just focus on the back focal planes, great turf, so this is total internal reflection. Uh, which illuminates the molecules close to the cover glass, so whether the 200 nanometer depth or something around there. The fluorescence then comes, is captured by the same objective and is focused onto a CCD. So this is the, the CCD that I showed you in the previous slide, which is the white square is the CCD here. Uh, folded into the fluorescent part is a white LED. So this white LED is essentially just there to point 
and create a, a, a very bright signal on the CCD. And essentially this LED is part of the microscope frame. So if there's a change in the microscope frame, which is sensed by this green uh, path, then it will be seen as a shift in X and Y here. And the piezoelectric mirror then just tilts it back in place. So this, these three components, the Y LED, the CCD, and the piezoelectric mirror work all together. So every time a CCD, the CCD image registers a, a shift, the piezoelectric mirror then repositions it in X and Y. But of course, the majority of the of the drift or the movement is not going to come from the from this section. It's going to primarily come from the sample stage. And to deal with that, we have, as I mentioned before, an an, an infrared LED. So we just have this bright LED shining onto the glass, onto our fiducials. The diffraction rings are then captured by this objective and then focused onto a CMOS camera. So this is the sort of complete version, which is you can get on on bio protocols. Um, We've in the meantime adapted it to different systems. So we also made lots sort of nature protocol type paper where we adapted it to either so Nikon TI or an ASI, et cetera. Um, the geometry is essentially the same. We have lasers going in, EMCCDs, infrared cameras separate and running in parallel from each other. So this is just the three different schematics or geometries that we use for the three different microscopes. Now, how does it how does it work essentially? What does it, how does it behave? So when the feedback is on, so when we drive, when we're synchronizing the stage with the camera, we get something of the order of 0.4 nanometers in X and Y. So it's very, very stable. Uh, this is possible for two reasons. One, uh, we have a very fast camera. So the camera runs at something of 400 frames a second, something like that. So we're capturing a lot of images. And this, the resolution of the stage is around one Armstrong. So it's a very precise stage. The same, looking at the actual dimension, it's the same story. So it's around one nanometer. So it's obviously going to be worse than the X and Y. And if you look here at the bottom, you can see it. we're running it for a very long time. So 75,000 seconds. I don't really recall how many hours that is. Um, if we have the feedback off, so if we turn off this three-dimensional feedback loop, uh, we can see almost after a couple of hours, the stage starts to drift away and you know it, it will easily get lost. Now, because we're synchronizing the stage and the calculations are very fast because it's done through G uh, graphics card, since we're synchronizing all this relatively fast or much faster than the on time of our DNA paint binding, uh, we're actually correcting for the sample while it's still emitting. So during the exposure time of the EMCCD, so while the, the camera is capturing the frame, we are actually realigning the positions of where the emission should, should be. Or, so what happens is we're actually correcting for drift while it's still emitting. And if you look at uh, these two sort of plots here at the bottom, the with the stabilization off, you get a, a three-dimensional drift of around three nanometers within one exposure time. So while the camera is on, uh, and with the feedback on, so with our, our feedback SLM system on, it's just it comes in just under one nanometer in three dimensions. Uh, so what happens is we're correcting for the for drift while these molecules are still emitting. So how does it look like in, in practice, looking something a little bit more uh, realistic as opposed to just graphs? Uh, here we're looking at a DNA paint origami ruler. So these it's basically rulers that you can buy now. Uh, they, essentially, it's a brick of DNA. So you have essentially a block of DNA, and these you have three points uh, shown here on the ruler, and these are separated by roughly 20 nanometers. And what we do is we just let this system stabilize, and we just run an acquisition for you know six, seven, 10 hours, whatever it is. And we we build up a picture and the reconstruction you can see is pretty clear. So we have very well-defined three, three dots which correspond to one ruler, separated roughly about 20 nanometers. If we draw a line profile across one of these points, we get a standard deviation of a one, around 1 1.3. So it's matching the... Uh, localization precision so it's essentially what we are after now and when we compare our 
system with a standard system. In this case, we're looking at a SAS microscope, and we run the exact same experiment for for our feedback with the feedback on because we're sort of comp compressing or you know realigning all these points. We get we get a standard deviation of around 1.5, 1.52, something like that. With with the standard version, so this is post drift corrected. So this is taking the fiducial beads, uh, like microspheres or gold na or gold nanoparticles, and realigning it through a redundant cross correlation, which is a technique to realign these guys. We get a standard deviation of around twelve. So it's it's a significant improvement just by using uh, this this feedback correction. So looking at um, a cell. So this is very similar to this to the cell that you saw in the very beginning uh on the title slider i guess and what we're looking at is uh actin so we just phylloid and stain we fix the phylloid in place through so streptavidin etc and we do dna paints on directly on the on the actin and you can see you can get a very clean reconstruction of where all the different actin fibers are etc if we zoom in into this white square and zoom in again oh, with this one arrow. At, yep. at, at this moment, we have a we have a raised hand. So I'm going to try and allow Okun Onong to talk. You yeah. can ask your question, Okun. Well, we cannot hear you at the moment. not we have a question from Mason mm -hmm. go ahead you can talk Mason are you there yeah hello yes we can Hi. hear you yeah thank you thank you for the webinar thank you very much uh, this is very uh uh, interesting and useful to me. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a beginner user of uh, confocal microscope and super high resolution, also super resolution. Uh, talking about the uh, the slide before this one, uh, where we see the uh, DNA pin 20 nanometer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm working on plant cell where I use uh, what I want to study plasma matter, which is also like 20 nanometer in size. Can we get mm -hmm. like a higher resolution than this one we see here? Using um, and we get higher than twenty. Yeah, higher um, than twenty. Yeah, yeah. Because the pore of the of the plasma this matter is twenty nanometer, and uh, this is like um, uh, I can see the pixels here in the picture yeah, on the left. Yeah, the pixels right. of the reconstruction. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we can go um, we can go less than this, right? Like like twenty nanometer is the um, minimum we can go, right? With any I, don't know if the, I don't think it's the minimum you can go. I mean, you should, hopefully, in principle, you should be able to go uh, smaller than that. But well, it sort of depends on a little bit on what system you're looking at. Because if you have sort of poor or something of that order, there's, there's tricks that you can play that with the labeling, et cetera, that can make it a bit easier. When you start going to dimensions that are significantly small, Right, you know, five nanometers, whatever. Then, uh -huh. you, when you have antibodies, they can start bumping into each other, and they stay, they're occupying the same space. Uh, so you, you got to be a little bit careful. I mean, to be honest, it, you'd have to try it. Is my my honest answer. Uh, of the if the pore hole is twenty nanometers, and maybe you can try staining on the outer outer circumference. I mean, I, I don't know specifically. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I understand. I'm. I'm not using antibodies. I'm using uh, fluorescent proteins to uh, that localize so, it. That yeah, so these, these are, yeah. Yeah. So this case is DNA paint. So what happens is we have a single strand of DNA sticking out of this brick, mm -hmm. um, and the complementary strand has the fluorophore on it, and that does the binding and unbinding. For the case of, you know let's say GFP or whatever you're trying to look at, then there's, there's a, there's a different, they're different systems entirely. 
Um, if there are antibodies that you can stain with, which you can tag a, what you can tag with a single strand of DNA, then I would suggest trying those. Uh, I would honestly try antibody staining first, just to see if it all works out before trying to dive into something this tricky. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the tip. Yeah. I will note this down. Yeah. Thank you. All right, no further uh, raise hands. Uh, can I keep going? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, all right. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so if we sort of zoom in onto a single strand of actin, you can see it's fairly well defined. If we draw, draw a line profile, it's of the order of 6.7 nanometers. So it's what you'd expect to get out of actin. Um, so I'm showing here what, is, what I'm calling the raw data. Of course, it's not the pure raw data, it's the fitted data, but what happens is a lot of people will, will filter according to um, photon counts or et cetera. So what we're showing here is basically whatever the algorithm, the fitting algorithm spits out is directly shown here. So we're not actually manipulating this at all. Um, so to move on to direct distance measurements. So this is a bit of a challenging problem that has been uh, around in the lab for quite some time. And that was to measure distances between species of proteins. So of the order you know, of the order of 20 nanometers, 30 around there, to be able to define a distance and see how far they separate. Or in, in other words, cluster, et cetera. The way we did it was we put a lipid bilayer on the surface. We added our polystyrene beads on top. So the lipid bilayer is biotin heads, put strep avidin on top of the lipid bilayer. And then we attached the biotin beads. And of course, the T cells go there. So the, what I'm showing here is phosphorylated CD3 zeta. So this is the phosphorylated version. This is the on version, if you can think of it that way, uh, of these TCR. So it's essentially the triggering mechanism for T-cells. So when T-cells want to kill things, the TCL will turn on and you get phosphorylated CD3 zeta, which is the intracellular tail. Uh, CD45, which is essentially the off switch for uh, TCR, is in green. And what I'm just showing here, this little box here in the corner, as you can see, it's pretty well separated and we can define the distance between uh, one and the other. So what we typically see is of the order of 20 nanometers when they are on in the, in the very beginning of this activation and sort of around 15 nanometers, 10 nanometers when they're off. Um, so we can now directly measure distances between complexes that we typically wouldn't be able to see before. Um, so just as a sort of summary slide for this starting version, uh, the active drift correction allows you to do long-term imaging. So what happens is you have very long experiments, such as DNA paints. Uh, we can do three, four channels. We can run the system essentially all week, and we don't really have a problem. Um, and by doing so, you obviously improve your image quality because now you don't need to drift correct. You don't need to play any software games. It's whatever, whatever it spits out is essentially what you want. Um, Again, it's compatible with a series of microscopes, ASI. In our case, we used Nikon TI. We used also uh, Mad City lab bodies, et cetera. Of course, now the problem is we have still a random distribution of markers. So if we throw down a series of uh, polystyrene beads, they land essentially where they want to land. You don't control specifically where they are. And to address this, we moved into doing direct laser writing, which is to use a focal point of light to uh, solidify a resist or to print within the slide. So primarily it's very similar to 3D printing where instead of having, uh, well, that's not working. Well, it's supposed to be a video. Um, for some reason it's not working. It's not really important. What happens is in 3D printing, you have a nozzle and the plastic, is heating up and essentially your it will follow a trajectory 
according to your design. So essentially you give the 3D printer a CAD design, which you are willing to print. It can be in a variety of shapes and sizes, and it will essentially just go line by line, point by point, and uh, solidify uh, plastic on that particular point. So you just essentially have a buildup layer by layer uh, of different sorts of plastic. In the case of direct laser writing, what happens is instead of having plastic uh, coming through a nozzle, you have a, a, U, a liquid photoresist. It's a UV curable resist. When you shine UV light on this resist, it becomes a solid. So what we do is we use uh, a two-photon system. So it's a commercial system. Uh, it's called the Nanoscribe. And what we do is uh, the two photon laser lights will focus on a specific point and solidify that point. And very similar to 3D printing, you just do point by point, layer by layer, and you build up a stack of different positions. And just showing very simply what one photon versus two photons. So one photon is what you know, normally have in a confocal system, for example. You just have a, a cone of light that illuminates throughout the sample. In the case of two photons, since you're using infrared lights, which is at double the wavelength of what you want to excite, you only create this very small dot. So it's sort of behind the cursor there. And that very small dot is a, is a small solidification volume uh, for our liquid photoresist. So instead of illuminating with one photon, which creates this entire cone, we use two photons that gives us a very high precision of the printing. So each point is around 100 nanometers so you can create features with you know 150 nanometers etc and the the game plan is practically the same so instead of having uh polystyrene beads that we randomly throw down we now print structures directly on the glass in our case i'm just showing here a pedestal but we can print basically whatever we want uh, the strategy is the same so it's the same system so an led diffraction rings it's the same sort of feedback loops, it's exactly the same principle where the stage is self-correcting and feeding in the new position of where this, the sample wants to be. Uh, shown, this is a very versatile technique and you can see judging by the different uh, things people can print, you can look at the scale bars, for example, you can see this quite nice horse printed here and the scale bars is 50 microns. So you can, you can really get clean detail of different points and you can print little spiders shown here on the left is they print a castle on top of a of the end of a pencil so you can print essentially very cool designs uh, through this sort of technology we did something a lot more simplistic than horses and spiders we just printed spheres we just printed spheres on pedestals we printed spheres with Post sticking out, We've shown here. There's little squares with these little cues to have fiducials inside of them. And what happens is because we're now printing at different hearts, we can now focus at different hearts as opposed to just focusing on the glass or directly on the polystyrene bead. So we now focus, let's say, ten microns up, fifty microns up, twenty microns up, etc. <clears throat> Each fiducial will cover a range, let's say plus or minus five microns, and we just use that range to to print, and you can see we can pr we just print different arrays, and we just we just uh, specify what we want to get out of it, and we just create these fiducial slides uh, uh, in mass, if you can think of it that way. So a lot we just print a stack of them. We keep them in a drawer. Whenever we want to use it, we just wash it and just use the we just use these as the fiducial markers, as instead of having to prep it with B uh, BSA biotin, etc. So for 3D focus locking, here I'm just showing a sphere. So we just printed a sphere to see how it works. I'm just showing you uh, a pre-programmed step size. So the program step size is in red. And the real position, which is done through a separate uh, detection system, is shown in blue. And you can see when we step it, you can see the rings changing. And it goes in and out of focus, right? So we can just slowly manipulate it. Here, doing the same with the pedestal. So now focusing instead of on the glass, we're focusing eight microns above the, above the glass and we do the exact same sort of format where we uh, 
dictate a pattern that we want the stage to go to and the stage essentially follows the same pattern that we decide again just going in and out of focus depending on the on the volume here is just the wall so it's the wall that i showed you before with the pen sticking out and this is now 20 microns this is essentially beyond what a typical cell volume should be so a typical cell volume was around 5 10 etc uh, here we're going slightly beyond that so we, here i'm just showing you 20 and it's, it's, it's essentially the same geometry where we have the program position the real position and we're detecting how it, how it moves but of course like i said before we're not restricted to pedestals or spheres or whatever we can print triangles and here i'm just showing you different uh here it's cubes so i'm just showing you different geometries with different sicknesses or different hearts etc you just see when one goes out of focus the, un the other one becomes in focus so just by stepping it through different hearts we now can monitor the monitor and focus lock on different positions by just having arrays showing all these different specifications um the advantage of this is of course it's very transparent because it's essentially a polymer and here we we show a cube and inside this cube we put a fiducial inside the box and the reason we put it inside the box is because now we're depositing these cells directly and we sort of just let them grow on the glass and they actually sort of lack the polymer so they they attach to the polymer they hug the polymer and we didn't want it to interfere with the fiducials inside so we essentially just printed a protection box where we put a fiducial in the middle and the cells don't like to grow over it because it's too high so we just essentially just print an array of these different cues with all these different spheres inside and we do single molecule localization microscopy so very similar to what i showed you before instead of uh dna paint i'm just showing you a uh, storm which is essentially a technique instead of having the complementary strands you use the, the molecule attached directly to the antibody to do the blinking it's a three-dimensional version so instead of using a two-dimensional reconstruction we have a cylindrical lens that allows us to sort of differentiate uh slightly hearts or different variations in hearts of the fluorophores but in practice we're just using it to image and demonstrate that it works in a biological scenario uh, and we can use these guys as opposed to just polystyrene beads shown here on the right hand side i'm just tagging a complex with cd 47 so it's a very common marker within the cell uh, again antibody with a point on, the Alexa 647 and we're just looking at it at different heights so I'm just showing that we can focus lock on the glass a micron and a half above and three microns uh, above so you can see on um, three microns up there's not many points to look at while if you look at the glass it's there's quite a few of them we track one individual molecule so we just park it and track one of the order after 25 seconds this moves around you know 500 nanometers or something like that so it's of the order of a few pixels uh, on the right hand side is just this 2d re 2d representation of what i'm showing on the left so it's just the different points as the molecule travels and stops and comes back and travels etc but of course the power of this guy is because we have a lot more versatility we don't need to we're not restricted by the glass anymore we can go beyond and focus lock above the glass right so we went back to our pedals our pedestal sticking out of our wall so this vertical wall with our three pedestals and now we can focus lock on different positions throughout right and we coupled this with a very cool technique that came out of Jean-Baptiste lab which is a uh, so spin which is, stands for single objective selective plane illumination microscopy what happens is the laser is reflected off a 45 degree mirror so within a chamber you have a 45 degree mirror the laser is reflected off that and creates a large sheet that goes through the cell and because now you can focus at <clears throat> if you position the light slightly below it will reflect at 45 degrees and be slightly below if it's higher then it will reflect and cut above so you can essentially dissect at different heights by focusing it on different parts of the mirror but of course now you have a, a slight problem which is of course if the sample goes in and up and down or in and out of focus you're gonna you're not gonna capture what you want but now you have you have an added component which is if the sample moves left and right now the laser is going to get reflected off a different part of the mirror 
and it's the you get the same effect in return. So it's actually moving in and out of focus through different axes. So in order to sort of circumvent that issue, we printed these pedestals in the chamber. So if you look here, this this snapshot here, we have a column with this these walls printed inside the inside each inside each well. And the mirrors, the 45 degree mirrors, are these black markers shown here. So we essentially deposit a bunch of cells inside these inside these chambers. And then we just image uh, using their technique. So it's this uh, SOSPIM. And we now capture different hearts using the, the single objective plane. And we do D-storm doing directly via the, via the plane. And we focus lock in different hearts using our pedestal. So using our points as reference markers, we now focus and stabilize the system at different heights and we focus lock it in different uh, different Z planes and in three dimensions. So just to finish up, the 3D printing allows you to, this direct laser routing or the 3D printing version uh, allows you to print nano features all the way up to full lenses. So you can print things that are millimeter ranges you can print things that are of the order of a few hundred nanometers and for us a really cool advantage of this is we can have a predefined reference markers for our sample or our stage and these are fixed so they're not really going anywhere in terms of performance they're comparable to the past iron beams even slightly better because now you don't have a chemical connection you you have a purely uh, printed sphere, uh, surface so it essentially becomes part of the glass and because we control where they are and how many they are and where they are, we can set the position. So we set one marker per field of view guaranteed. So we now we, we always have one marker per slide and we just use, uh, we just use the cells as they, as, they, as they prefer, if you can think of it that way. So we don't have to select the cell where there's a bead in the vicinity. We can just, we always have one guaranteed. Um, so just to finish up, I'd like to thank Katharina Gauss and Justin for their help. Of course, Jungo worked a lot on the, on these on this project with me. So uh, I thank him a lot. Um, I, of course, here at the bottom, we have different projects that I was involved in. So the adaptive optics uh, with Simon, Simon and Simon, so both Simon Pollen and Simon Amerbeck at King's. I didn't have time to talk to you about. Uh, lots of slide sheet stuff, which I didn't include either. Uh, I did with Ben and Alexandros. Um, of course, to finish up, I'd like to thank basically the people who pay me. So, you know, Inner Valley, ERC, and, and MHRC, et cetera. Um, and thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Mao, for, for a very exciting talk. Um, the, that light sheet imaging at the end. Have you, have you thought about applying that to polarized uh, cell polarity complexes and proteins that are known to be localized so you mean, throughout the cells. You mean this part here? Yeah. Uh, we didn't, so we didn't actually, um, we're not, we're, at this point we're not, but we weren't particularly interested in in um, specific complexes. We, we're thinking about using this technique technique to, to look at T-cell APC interaction. So you have essentially a T-cell yeah. and an APC that come into contact. And because you can now dissect the contact point, we're sort of thinking about looking at that. Uh, we haven't got around to doing it yet because we just was sort of wanted to wrap up the project and put a little bow on it. So in terms of getting it done, it wouldn't add significantly to the paper. So we just let it as is um but sure there's there's a whole range of options i would definitely check out uh john batiste's um publication on this so so it's been it's, it's yep. a very cool technique all right thank you uh with that we have a uh, we have a large number of questions that came in through the the q a or the uh, website um, to start off with one for for your imaging um do you use any special kind of cover slips do you take care of um uh, the um, the refractive index that it matches immersion oils or uh, so any cover slip work. So the typical cover slip. So you have your one point five cover slips, which is what you normally buy. Uh, that's basically what we use. 
so it's it's just standard cover stuff you just do there's some approaches like, for example like the lipid valleys that you need to make sure that they're very clean etc uh, but for the most part it's standard optical glass all right thank you and a question from uh, philip matthias uh, to us uh, with your camera running at 400 fps do you have this uh, stabilization algorithm running on an fpga board so the the algorithm is running through a graphics card unit so essentially we have a really expensive graphics card that that pulls the images straight off the camera does the calculations and then just spits out the numbers that we need to correct for so there's a whole lot of sort of back-end work that went into making us uh, come together that I've not really shown you here. Um, but essentially, the GPU will calculate these guys at kilohertz rates. So it's far beyond the frame rate of the camera. And what happens is we will pull 10 images out of the camera, do the calculations, and then drift correct on the average of, the, of those 10 frames, and then sort of repeat the procedure. All right, uh, but what is the the size limit of the uh, direct laser writing? So the size limits, well, and going bigger is probably easier than going smaller. So you can go, you can print stuff in the millimeter ranges. That's people have done that. Uh, if you go very very small, so sort of one hundred nanometers, fifty nanometers, then it becomes a lot trickier and it's not trivial to do. Uh, but anything where you require a feature of, let's say, 300 nanometers, 500 nanometers is very doable. And you can you can print relatively high. It's just a matter of waiting because it's it's still it's relatively slow the bigger you get, essentially. So if you get very big features, then it will take a long time. I guess that uh, that makes sense. <laughs> With that, we come to the uh, the inevitable question, right? We 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 have our cells, we have our uh, we have our fiduciaries, but what about going to even more complex uh, setups? And think about uh, tissue sections, or perhaps even uh, developing embryos and bigger organisms. Do you think that um, this technology could work for more complex systems like that? So, well, yes and no. So when you're looking at, so what happens is you need, the LED needs sort of a clear sight of the marker, right? So the marker needs to be in the vicinity and it needs to be visible and it's best not to have anything in its way. So if you, if you have, for example, a tissue section, you need some sort of square area where you can place these beads on, right? So you can get a clear view of that. If you, if you mix in the beads, with a big thick tissue sample then the diffraction rings will probably get lost if you have let's say a let's say a layer of cells you can always make sort of like a like a cut in them you can remove certain cells and then add the beads on top that's or add the beads to the glass there that's that's also doable um i'll be a little bit hesitant to say it would work in anything like an embryo i don't think it, i don't think it's made, meant for that and never really give it that much thought to be honest but it sounds like if you if you develop something like a 3d culture that you might actually be able to uh, to get some data out of that perhaps yeah i mean if it's in this sort of well format like i showed you here then i guess yeah i suppose it will work all right and uh, another question is can this the, this technique be expanded to a pharmaceutical level check coding patterns of uh, nanopart particles, for instance? Mm. Uh, sure answer, I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get it out of the range of the uh, academic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> academic settings. Then we have some questions if you can observe specific things like uh, NETOs, net doses by neutrophils. Um, so the technique of the stabilization is to allow you to see things better. It's not necessarily a staining protocol. So it's not it's not designed for you to be able to, it's not a, well, if you want to tag things, whatever they whatever they may be, whether it's neutrophils, T cells, macrophages, whatever, uh, that's sort of down to the antibodies, not necessarily down to the stabilization, if that makes sense. Or did I misunderstood the question? Yeah. 
no, I, I think I think you're 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 absolutely uh, getting getting the right point. So people want to know what what you can specifically image, and ultimately you're dependent on the tool with which you're labeled the, the molecule of interest, right? And you just have the the better um, resolution of uh, imaging data coming out of that, is what you're what you're saying. Essentially, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, does the uh, the shape, size, position of a fiducial marker um, in relation to the sample matter? So we opted to do bees within a certain range. So we typically did around three microns diameter because it's a, it's a good size. You get good diffraction rings um, and it's not too big. So you, you get a decent, you get a very good sort of output out of it. Uh, if it gets too big, so something of the like five microns, 10 microns, 20 microns, then your diffraction wings will be significantly large and that might get in the way of the cells. If it's too small, then of course you don't see them at all or see very little of it. You, so you don't get the accuracy that you would hope. Generally, we opted for three micron beads and it worked very well for us. The pillars that we, like on this example here, for example, those are all three microns within that range. Uh, so three, four microns. Uh, those typically work for us and have worked in the past. Okay, great. And then maybe if you uh, if you uh, have uh, access to a regular commercial system and you wanna you wanna um, adapt it to basically get the stabilization set up uh, up, up and running, um, how would you recommend one goes about doing that? And maybe a related question is um, when should you? So I guess when is when you need to, because they very, the stage in order to do this is, is of the order of fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, right? So they're not particularly cheap stages. So if you don't require this sort of precision or accuracy, then perhaps you're better off investing in a $20,000 stage than a fifty dollars or $60,000 stage with a very small travel range. Uh, so the travel ranges of the order of 50 to 200 microns. So they're very small travel ranges. So it's essentially designed in our, in our hands. We used it exclusively for the drift correction, not for positioning samples, et cetera. So it's, it's another layer of expense that not everyone can afford. Uh, in order to do so, if you want to, we have not only the bioprotocol paper, but a nature protocol paper. So we basically shared this around as much as we could. Uh, we got a little bit overwhelmed with the amount of people that wanted to do it. So we just decided, okay, we'll just release as many protocols as we can. And whoever wants to put it together can do so. Um, so there's the component lists in both the bio protocol and the nature protocol, all the component lists, how to assemble the original version. So this is the sort of very sturdy, all stainless steel uh, setup. If you want to adapt it to a Nikon TI or an ASI or whatever comes after, or a commercial system that you have in house, then perhaps the Nature Protocol is the best bet for you because it will show you how to assemble it, how to put it together, what components you need to buy. The whole list is there, the software is there. I mean, we're basically just giving it away for as many people to use as they feel free and hopefully improve on it, ideally. Great, thank you for, for, for highlighting that. We got one more raised hand, so I'm gonna allow HH Study to speak up. You are with us. And it looks like we are well, so with that, I think we come to the uh, to the hour. So thank you again, uh, Simal, for uh, for a wonderful and exciting talk. Cindy, do you want to make some final remarks as we close? Yes, yes. So thank you all for staying until the end. And um, thank you, Antoine, for hosting this wonderful Q&A session. And of course, thank you very much, Simal, for this amazing talk. I'm so glad you kicked this session off for us. Um, as I said, uh, this uh, webinar was recorded and it will be posted on our website very soon. We will send an email when it's ready. 
In case you your questions were not addressed today, they will all be moved to the Q&A board here that you can see in the slide on our website. We have a Q&A section there and your questions, all the questions from today actually will be moved there so you can revisit them and you can keep posting questions and we will invite Simao and other experts to answer them and we want to really build a community there. So um, please feel free to use, use this Q&A board. Um, also, I don't want to miss to um, announce our second webinar in about a month on September 13. We have a slide for this too. Um, there we go. On September 13, we will have a talk about quality control for biological mass spectrometry. And we'll have an expert speaker there as well, Dr. David Tabb will talk, it, it will probably be a longer talk actually. And um, we have an expert moderator too, David Fenio. Both of them will be talk, talking on the day for you. So um, please join us for this talk and please visit our website for any future webinars that we will be posting there soon. Thank you very much. See you next time.